Hello, you're watching a special edition of uh, CNBC Africa where we are dissecting the budget that's been presented in Parliament by the Finance Minister of South Africa, Enoch Godongwana. If you watched us in Power Lunch, I had uh, Kobas Potkita, Portfolio Manager, I asked him, what are you trading today? He said, Godfrey, I am going for the banks. So guess who is at, to at the top of the leaderboard? It's first run, 4.1 percent, 91 up 3.5 percent, uh, and also Coronation Fund Managers up 2.9 percent. In part, it tells you who is one of the winners. What has the RAND done? The first indicator of whether the markets like this budget or not, the RAND is still strong, 1805 against the U.S. dollar. Annabel Bishop is a chief economist at uh, Investex. She's joining us for this discussion. Uh, Professor David Vanneka, chair of uh, SICAS National Tax uh, Committee, is joining us as well. As I said later, Peter Atad Montalto, head of Capital Markets in Teledex, is going to be joining the conversation. Annabel, I was going to begin with you and ask if uh, the overrun that you had budgeted was in line with what the minister announced. Welcome. Hi, Godfrey. Yes, you know, the, the, the actual, very importantly, the gross loan debt forecasts were in line with what I forecast. And, you know, that is for the medium term being around 70% of GDP. So I think, you know, the financial markets did like this um, budget as far as it's been reflected in the RAND. We saw it moving to 1796 um, to the US dollar. So a bit of strength there. I think that's some good news because we've seen, obviously, a very weak currency. Yeah. Um, coming through in the last several months. Bear in mind, however, that the backdrop is one of extreme global risk aversion. And as a consequence, we would not expect too much positive impact on financial markets here in South Africa from the budget, even though it is a good budget. The one thing I would say to you is while the debt levels, um, the percentage peaks um, <clears throat> sooner than expected and in fact peaks at a lower percentage of gdp and while there's been some actual cut off of debt itself in terms of borrowing projections over the medium yeah. term yeah. and in fact the fiscal deficit as well drops down to three percent so again all in line with attempting fiscal consolidation the the point really here however is that um for, for south africa to see fiscal to see a sustainable government um finance set of finances the debt levels are seen to be closer to about 60 percent although the fiscal deficit of about three percent sounds right mm -hmm. so from that perspective we're moving into the right direction but we're not there yet and i think yeah. you know that's really what the minister tried to convey today as well that you know we're in a difficult environment it could get worse globally yeah. one last point i want to make godfrey is i think you know you and i talked earlier in the week and we were saying that the high inflation rate would deflate the fiscal ratios and that's exactly what's happened you know when you have a high inflation rate your nominal gdp um, yeah. comes out significantly higher which is what we've seen in other words your debt and your deficit as a percent of gdp come out lower and that certainly had an impact on our fiscal ratios today yeah, so you used a word that I was going to ask you to use to try to characterize the budget, i.e., was this a good budget? And I think you used the word. But I wanted to ask if you would go so far as to say that uh, the minister has uh, absolutely done the best that he could in the circumstances. I think it's an okay budget. I think it might be a bit of a stretch to say it's a good budget. I think, you know, <laughs> it's difficult um, given the current environment that we're in that... Um, there's a risk of obviously substantial slow economic growth next year. In fact, even risk of a global recession. We've seen on Bloomberg's investors are factoring in, you know, 100% chance. And of course, that really speaks to this risk aversion I'm talking about in financial markets. And I've run through all the fiscal um, ratios. But I think you know, he, he has done well with what he's got, you know, with the revenue overrun and with the expenditure. It's a difficult environment. You can't really say we can't give bailouts to um, Eskom or Transnet. Um, given that they are so key for yeah. economic growth in South Africa. Yeah. But I, I like the, the caveats he's put in place and that there needs to be extreme caution in taking Eskom's debt onto the balance sheet, even if it's one to two thirds of the 400 billion, to make sure that the entity doesn't become over indebted again, it, it, that it's unable to service the debt. Because government cannot rescue Eskom likely a second time. It's yeah. going to put strain on our government finances. Yes, the credit rating agencies do include Eskom in our um, government debt calculation. We think the budget is probably credit neutral to maybe slightly positive. I think it's just a bit hard, you know, because we don't know exactly how severe the global <clears throat> economic slowdown will be. Yeah. It is expected to be centered more on advanced economies than obviously um, emerging markets, but we couldn't expect to see South Africa escape unscathed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see you smiling, uh, Annabel. I can see you smiling. Uh, Peter, Peter joins us now. Uh, Peter, I wanted uh, to ask as well, right at the outset, whether you are happy and uh, whether you would use a single word like good uh, bad, uh, not good, two words, 
to describe the budget that's just been presented. Hi, great to be uh, back with you. Um, I think this is a great starting point to see fiscal slippage from, and I think that's the way to put it. There are huge execution risks here. Uh, there are huge revenue risks, but we have pretty decent buffers coming in. We have a 41 to 47 billion of unallocated reserves in the outer two fiscal years. Uh, we have some decent buffers uh, in the next fiscal year uh, as well. So. Overall, I think it's, uh, as I said, if we're going to have execution risk, uh, this is the place to start from. The budget is probably going to appear a little worse uh, than this, but we are in, a, I think, a meaningfully different fiscal place uh, than we were uh, thinking we would be, uh, even in 2019, uh, to be honest, even even pre, uh, pre-COVID. Uh, yeah. And so whilst we may not get back this 1.5% primary surplus, I think politically it's going to be very challenging, yeah. even if we're coming in at a shallower profile, uh, this is still going to be a more positive dynamic, certainly. The big surprise today, I think, is what they're penciling in uh, in terms of issuance. Uh, they can actually cut SAGB issuance next year, and that's quite a shock to, I think, local bond managers uh, who were sort of expecting, I think, consensus was uh, an increase uh, next year. So there, there is the possibility of doing that. A Treasury might not take all of that space that exists. Uh, they may well remain quite risk averse. But again, this is looking much more positive than the budget back in February when um, the implied levels of, of SAGB issuance were uh, actually a lot higher uh, yeah. than the coming now in the MTBPS. So, so sorry, back to one, back to one word. Yeah, uh, I, I would say yes. Okay, okay, all right. But uh, another question that will obviously come into play. I remember we had this discussion, I, I think it was not uh, Minister Kotong, and I think it was the minister before that, and we were talking about the fact that the markets obviously have to believe the numbers. I wanted one more point around that. Are the numbers credible, believable? So yes, within reason, right? Uh, and I said there's going to be some slippage, and if we expect that, yes, uh, then actually, you know, uh, we manage our expectations, and they're okay. Our revenue numbers are roughly the same. Interestingly, we actually have a VAT hike in our, our own forecast, uh, which they don't talk about at MTPS. I think they will actually end up having to do some or try and do some kind of tax hike uh, in the new year, and maybe implicit in some of these numbers. Uh, and the, and we have to see how they allocate some of these uh, unallocated reserves and where the political pressures. Uh, around that are. I think it was a little bit of a mistake today not to make SRD permanent. It's only a one-year extension. I yeah. think that's kind of sort of odd, odd games, if you like, uh, given uh, uh, you know, given the underlying political dynamic uh, uh, around that. But no, the, the numbers, I think, are roughly, roughly okay versus our own forecasts. Yeah. I'm going to use a word to describe the minister as well as uh, the governor of the Reserve Bank and suggest that South Africa has got uh, two conservative uh, 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 um, officials in charge of uh, the South African Reserve Bank and the South African National Treasury. If anyone disagrees with me, let's see if we can uh, take up that argument. Um, David, can I come to you? I wanted your overall initial uh, impressions on that budget and if there were any surprises, like Peter mentions, no VAT uh, discussed, and uh, also uh, the, there's uh, the issue of uh, 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 no, 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 no general tax increases, as it were. Yeah, Godfrey, hi, and um, yeah, look, this isn't the, the occasion where major tax policy changes are announced, so that was no real surprise to me that there weren't any in there. Okay. Um, in line, I think, pretty much with what was expected widely, um, I think the, gro the gross revenue overrun of about 83 billion rand was sort of in line with expectations. Um, it does mean that tax to GDP ratio of 25% is going to be pretty high, is very high by comparative standards. Um, what was quite pleasing to me was the uh, mention of the cases that have led to 4.8 billion of tax collections resulting from the state capture inquiry with 222 cases. I thought that was quite good progress, although we've, I think, been collectively frustrated in South Africa at the sl relatively slow progress of of that, but it's good to see that the wheels are turning. Um, and um, I, I was quite pleased to, or maybe sort of surprised, pleased to see talk of efficiencies at SARS that could possibly lead to a permanent increase in revenue. Um, what I was hoping might be announced here is uh, an update on where they are with the discussion document that was going to be released. Um, it was announced in February 21's budget. 
um, to do with governance at SARS because while we are seeing that they are efficient at collecting tax, there certainly are issues around uh, dispute resolution with SARS accountability and so forth for decisions that are made and uh, so I think that document is long overdue but to come back to the, the starting point I think it was largely in line with what I had expected yes. So that would suggest that if I were to ask you to use one word to describe the budget you would say it was a good budget. I'm going to end another question on top of that. Uh, let me just quickly give you another question on top of that. I wanted your thoughts in terms of the strength of the collections on both the corporate as well as personal income to our sides. Yeah, um, Godfrey, I, uh, the first point, I think I would describe it um, as, um, you know, fairly good, I suppose, from a, from a tax point, just looking at it from the income, to, uh, well, from a tax point of view overall. Um, because I think that if there had been announcements of increases in corporate rates or increases in taxes overall, I think that would have been very negative. I don't think that we can, uh, you know, that we in, in the space for increases at the moment. I think, if anything, one could look at reducing the corporate tax rate, maybe an increase in the VAT rate, possibly one, one could argue for, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. But that, of course, we know is a hot potato. Um, <laughs> But, you know, with regard to the strength of the, of, of the recovery, um, yes, I think with the higher commodity prices uh, still continuing, yeah. um, that's not really a surprise that the corporate uh, income tax collections have been good. Um, the, and, and then it, it was mentioned that there's an overall recovery as well. Uh, I suppose post-COVID one would have expected that. Um, individuals did maybe surprise me slightly um, that there, there has been quite a strong collection from them, but it's it's not nearly as high as, as the corporate collections and the import duties, which I suppose are also not really a surprise on the collection um, of imported products. Yeah, and I suppose also we have to factor any inflation, as, uh, as uh, Annabel was saying. Let me come to you, Annabel, and ask uh, maybe a, a, a difficult question. What is the difference between uh, holding debt uh, inside the name of ESCOM and taking it onto the uh, national treasury? National treasury, uh, because as the minister says, they are going to take between a third and two thirds. Could he have taken the whole thing anyway and gotten done and dusted with it? So from the credit rating agencies, they say there's not much difference. They assess South Africa's state um, debt as essentially including the debt at guarantees. And that, of course, in bulk is Eskom's um, debt out of, out of those guarantees. The key point, I think, is that government is probably quite wary of taking on Eskom's debt. You know, taking on one to two thirds instead of the entire amount. I think there's concern that taking on the entire amount possibly gives Eskom free reign to rack up its borrowings again and could run into um, <clears throat> financial issues that might not be able to um, generate the revenue that it hopes and might not be able to service the debt. I think those are valid concerns, you know, from government. The key point really is that whether it takes on one third or two third, obviously that will then um, swap its yep. debt ratios and reduce some of this fiscal consolidation. Um, the point really is that possibly it's a good time to think of doing it, um, and which is what the minister said today, <laughs> and to start doing it, which is not what he did today. Yeah. And the point really is that, you know, we, we need to find ourselves in a situation where some rescue plan actually does come through from Eskom. I mean, having a look at what the minister actually said, and I'm just going to, you know, find find the um, point uh, that, that, that he mentioned, yes, was okay. that he said that um, National Treasury is leading a process to finalize the debt relief program designed to restore Eskom to efficiency and financial Sustainability. Yeah. And that's very important as well. You know, fiscal uh, to, to, to restore it to efficiency and financial sustainability. So it's not just about taking the um, debt onto government's balance sheet and giving Eskom free reign to, you know, do what it would after that. Yeah. It's also, um, you're looking to, at the selection of the relevant debt instruments, method of affecting the relief. It's still being finalized. I think National Treasury is being very careful. I think they really want to give a very strong message to Eskom yeah. that they need to be cautious in yeah. terms of borrowing 
going. And, you know, yes, they could obviously have wholesale taken it on, but of course that would have had some negative market impact. Yeah. I think the slow um, process that they're doing is probably the right one, but I do think that there are probably other mechanisms. You know, the, the bottom line essentially is that South Africa's state debt itself is still, you know, very high. We're looking at the um, debt escalating, I think I had the figure just now, to 5.4 trillion by um, 2025, 20. 2024-25 obviously the concern there is that yeah. it's double what it was in 2018-19 at sure. 2.8 trillion so yeah. we haven't really eroded the um, effect of the pandemic and of course you know the point is that now we're looking to load more debt on everything you know might be manageable if we don't run into another crisis you know we're not essentially out of the woods here godfrey yeah Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and you're building up my case, by the way, and we're going to come back to my case and talk about it. Peter, does it matter? One third, two thirds, uh, the whole hog. And uh, in addition to that, does that change the dynamic in terms of South Africa's credit rating with the rating agencies? So there's been a very bizarre split on this issue since 2019 between local investors and foreign investors. Uh, foreign investors are far more used to dealing with these sorts of credit workout situations than local investors. We saw this with the massive pickle uh, that Land Bank has gotten into on their debt restructuring with local investors. Um, but we should remember that this, uh, the ESCOM debt plan was largely written in 2019. Nothing basically has changed since then. We've had all these crazy ideas coming out from a variety of locals on debt for equity swaps, on uh, structured equity solutions, et cetera, none of which were ever going to happen. Uh, right, PI, um, GIPF involvement, all these sorts of things, which were never going to happen. Uh, this has always been about a uh, a switch auction process, a voluntary switch auction process, where people would get SAGBs in return for ESCOM debt, uh, not a change of obligor, not a restructuring, not a haircut. And so we are finally getting to that position. Treasury has bought on board expertise. Um, you know, we're going to, I think, see them talking a lot more openly now in public, as well as in private with bondholders. Uh, on these things now in the run-up to the budget, ready for execution in the new fiscal year. But as Annabelle says, this doesn't solve, you know, it's not the be-all and end-all of solving ESCOM. This is one small component that you have to make sure, uh, particularly a future uh, uh, ESCOM CEO, you haven't had me on the program since I started saying, uh, Godfrey, that I see, uh, uh, you know, Andre probably exiting for the end of the fiscal year. This is, you have to lock in the future leadership of uh, yeah. Uh, of a of ESCOM to make sure that they don't go crazy uh, yeah. with a delevered uh, balance sheet. Yeah, I would have uh, a theft about if I had been allowed to do so. But I wanted to be clear, uh, Peter, uh, there's been no talk of a haircut here. There's likely to be no haircut for creditors. Local, there will be no haircut. There, there will be absolutely no haircut. Now, now there's a very, really interesting question that one can have over a, you know, a cocktail about should there be yeah. and should hedge funds who made a lot of money out of it get haircuts but that's the government is so risk averse on this they are not going to do anything around haircuts this is a npv neutral switch that's going to happen uh for people people are not going to make losses uh out of this process sure the whole stance around uh, soe reform does it allay any of the fears in the markets about uh, the government uh, potentially losing this battle given the struggles that we have seen around Transnet and also, of course, uh, the other Paris state house we just talked about, the land bank? Well, yes and no. I mean, I think Treasury's stance is exceptionally clear here of the need of conditionality on all SOEs, uh, and uh, they will be bringing that forward. I think in describing this in quite a lot of detail, uh, we'll be seeing as they're quizzed on this in Parliament and, and in public and with investors on the roadshow, this will all start coming out, I'm, I'm sure. Now, of course, Treasury is just one half of this. There is DPE, yeah. uh, there are the other entities as well. You know, ESCOM has been given its leadership very open to this sort of discussion. Uh, Transnet, I think, is going to be more of a battle. We've seen that around uh, what's happened around 30-party rail access and some of the complications of doing uh, some of the reforms uh, overall. So I think the proof is going to be in the pudding very much on, uh, on Transnet. Uh, but yeah. you know, the Treasury line here is, is very, very clear. Yeah. David? Did uh, Godongani miss a trick in uh, solving the BIG problem? Could he have done it under the uh, 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 framework of uh, trying to address a very, very high inflation rate in an environment globally where people sort of understand uh, government interventionist measures to try to cushion the poor from the high inflation we see? Godfrey, I, I doubt it. I mean, I think uh, it was maybe a sensible approach to just push it out for another year. Um, and then to say that anything further than that must be sort of revenue neutral in a way, I think that's probably right. 
I don't think South Africa, as sad as it is, can afford to be a welfare state in any way at all. And, uh, you know, without the growth that we would so much long for, I, I really don't think that there was another way of, uh, of uh, you know, boosting any of, of those grants, unfortunately. What we really need yeah. is to have, uh, a, you know, expenditure that actually boosts economic growth and go for the longer term. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, do, poverty relief in that, that fashion. Yeah, I was going to ask quickly if you like Godormane, given the fact that uh, what we're seeing here is restrained in an environment where you could have done things that generally the markets and I think uh, business people would have understood, but he hasn't. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not too sure that there, that there was really much else that, that could have been done in that mm -hmm. regard. Okay, all right. One final thought with you. Corruption, the anti-corruption fight. Uh, there's uh, I mean, a, a couple of pages that have been devoted to what the government is doing around that. Are you convinced that uh, this could be a line in the sand that perhaps helps South Africa transition into a new environment where, as you spoke about, the strength of the constitution and democracy and the need for accountability that we could finally be seeing here, people being brought to book for their sins? Godfrey, I really hope that that is the case. I mean, you know, these 222 cases sound impressive. But really, I think it's just the tip of the iceberg. You know, this the, so, state capture went so deep and so on that uh, it's it, it's a mammoth undertaking to try and bring all of those uh, criminals to to justice. Unfortunately, but certainly this is a you know a, a move in the right direction. Whether or not it will play a major part in us being able to avoid grey listing is you know I suppose doubtful. Sadly. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it, it certainly does does indicate that that uh, that we're on the right path, even if it's you know still quite, quite limited. The right path. Annabel, um, I was saying you were building up my case uh, on uh, the character of the minister here. And uh, in parting, I wanted to ask if uh, uh, Godong on a two point or is a minister that you believe uh, South Africa uh, needs at this particular juncture and is uh, perhaps doing a good job in the circumstances. Peter, the same question is coming to you. Yes, I do actually, um, uh, Godfrey. You know, I've actually been very pleasant, very pleased um, by his performance so far. I think he's done really well. What One of the things he's done, I mean, he's done many things, but one <laughs> of the things he's done is to hold a hard line on um, excessive salary and wage increases. We'll see how well he does with the 3% for the um, public sector. You know, that, that's quite low, given that inflation is around 7.5% in South Africa. So at the moment, obviously, it's expected to come down and, you know, drop back down towards the midpoint next year. So I think he's I think he's got a lot of strong goals. I think he, uh, fiscal consolidation goals, I think he's, he's sticking to them. He's actually delivering in some areas. He has obviously not been handed an easy um, environment to um, run public finances in. But you know, my quick summary, which I'm sure you want to uh, quick, is yes. that he's doing he's doing quite well given the circumstances. Yeah, Peter, you warming up to him or not? Well, I mean, I think the ultimate sort of test of uh, a minister of finance is what do they do with their style, right? And I think what we've really seen in this case is that the you know, we often exaggerate how strong Treasury is. I know we've talked about that a lot in the past, but really the best people in Treasury, I think, have been very strongly supported by the minister. Uh, and that's what you're seeing coming out here uh, from various different areas, whether that's SOEs, uh, asset liability management, um, whether that's uh, you know, the budget office, uh, et cetera, or economic policy. The, and that, that, I think, is, is the minister's sort of secret source and what we haven't actually seen um, with some of his, his predecessors. So I, for me, that is, is really the, the test which he passes. Yeah, he passes. He says, I'm going to take that. And I think it's something that I agree with. And so I think my characterization, lady and gentlemen, is correct. We have a conservative finance minister or a conservative finance minister in the making. We have a conservative, conservative uh, governor of the South African Central uh, Bank. And uh, I think in this environment, that's a good thing. Let me thank uh, my uh, panelists today. Annabel Bishop, Chief Economist at Investec. Thank you again for your time, Annabel. We appreciate it. Peter Atad Montalto, Intellitex. Thank you, sir, for taking time to chat to us in Southern Africa. Uh, Professor David uh, Vanekar, Chair of SICAS National Tax Committee. Thank you all for your time and your insights.